We do want to take a minute and say thanks to Cambia, the Grove, and the BioEngage program for sponsoring this series. It's very, very uh, nice to have that support, that infrastructure, and that brain power. So, uh, and thank you all for being here. Anish, welcome. Lee, thanks for having me. All right, man. <laughs> now, as, as Maura indicated, one of the things we do in this series is we like to talk about sort of the big picture. What are the forces driving change yep. in healthcare? What are the directions and what are the implications, right? Uh, and so uh, you've got a lot of perspective to help us bore into that, both the big picture and some specifics. But you know, before we start that, who are you? Where, <laughs> where did you come from? How did you end up in this complex ecosystem? Uh, I am a uh, health policy enthusiast, uh, but my uh, background and my bias. Is that a mental health disorder? It or? is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it was because, in part, I was uh, at the at Johns Hopkins when uh, President Bill Clinton got going with the first round of the affordable his version of health care reform with with uh, with uh, Mrs. Clinton, and uh, our university president was quite active on the policy debate, and I was pretty active on campus. So you get your your teeth He's sunk a buddy into of mine, it. Bill Brody. Yes. Yeah. Well, look at the yeah. legends of the world come yeah, together. Right. So I, uh, I, I, I had a fascination with the internet and an understanding and an appreciation of healthcare. And I was wondering why we can't bring the power and potential of both to make a difference in people's lives. So I grew up, Lee, uh, thinking about healthcare, understanding and appreciating that the internet might be a platform by which many public services could be improved, education, energy, and health. And uh, I was get blessed with the opportunity professionally to spend a decade at a firm called the Advisory Board studying and publishing on this. And then as a public service, uh, uh, as a public uh, servant in the state of Virginia, Commonwealth, where I served as Secretary of Technology before I went to President Obama's uh, White House. And I will say along the way, you see so much inspiration when you find ways to move power centers from the middle but you put them out to the edge you see so many wonderfully talented people diving in and contributing and that was sort of the most refreshing part of this journey Lee well, and I think we're gonna get into that in healthcare yeah well let's let, let's uh, latch on to that White House experience a little bit how did you end up in the White House and what did you come to learn about how the senior levels of government think and operate, both with respect to technology in general and healthcare in particular? Uh, and, uh, and so, what is your sense of how they think and what is the perception of healthcare? It, it uh, is definitely an arrow moving in the uh, upward direction in terms of both parties understanding and, and desiring to take fuller advantage of the power and potential of technology in health and other sectors. Uh, I was uh, Virginia's Secretary of Technology, where I was blessed by working under Governor Tim Kaine's leadership. And as you recall, politically, there were rumors that he might have been a finalist to be a uh, vice presidential candidate. And along the way, the New York Times had done a beautiful piece uh, that said, if you wanted a window into Barack Obama's future economic plan, it was called the Virginia model. And I have no credit in any of this, obviously. I was a worker bee, but the philosophy was Virginia went from a bottom performing economic state to a top 10 performing economic state in a couple of, in a, basically in a generation and a half. And it was because of a fairly clear model about good governance, investments in education, advancements in society. And we just were carrying along the, 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 the rotation. When he became president, while my governor wasn't vice president, he did say, can Anish come out and join the transition team I want to create a cabinet level position that reported to me that would have the voice of technology, data, and innovation at the table when we make big policy decisions. And I had no idea that I would serve in that role. I was helping to draft the job description, assuming someone from the Bay Area or up here would take the role. And uh, a few months later, uh, I got the call and was honored to serve uh, for the president. And I would say, Washington writ large had underutilized this muscle mass. Mm -hmm. If you were a policy student, you would have a lawyer. A lawyer was like the driver of policy, call it 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Then the economists came in. Oh, we're going to do incentives and programs. And for some reason, I think we're entering an era where doers, engineers, technologists are, 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 are outsizing the involvement in, in, in the delivery of, of the public sector. And it's partially because 
we, we do a lot in government, but we don't do it all quite as well as we could. And there's a basic understanding that if we could do a better job internally, and we could hardwire this, this muscle mass in the society at large, we could be better. You know, if you read the media, sure. you would think the depth of thinking about healthcare in Washington, D.C. is about a millimeter and a half, right? That, that it's, so all, depressing. it's all about politics and, and, and special interests. And yet, I think, wasn't it President Obama who pointed to the elephant in the room that says healthcare costs way too much and it's limiting society's ability to do other things and we have to fix that? Yes. And, and that's a deep problem that, that is going to take all of us to work on. But do people in Washington, D.C. actually appreciate that? So uh, we were having this conversation earlier. Let, uh, let me start with the bias. You're going to hear generally optimistic and positive statements coming out of me because I'm generally, I look for the best in people and I hope the best. So I will say things that you might say, this guy's crazy. There's, there's all this negative energy in D.C. Take my word for it. There are two Washingtons. There's the Washington that is the popcorn eating entertainment show. And it is depressing, but yet addictive. <laughs> like, yeah, we're all I hate that, but it is. Yeah. Oh my goodness, did you see that tweet? And what is that? Whoa! That's uh, the popcorn entertainment side of Washington. Then there is an operations side to Washington where actually there's a lot more alignment than uh, misalignment. And then there's a line in the middle where good people might have different opinions about conceptual agreement about one thing, but I want to take it in a different direction. Overwhelming debate and, and argument and all the struggle has been to solve one big problem in American healthcare, which is access. That's right. Right? But the elephant in the room is cost. So what's going on in DC in terms of thinking constructively about moving this incredibly inertial system. You know, the word glacial arguably wasn't invented for glaciers, right? It, but uh, who's thinking strategically about how to move the cost? Uh, so, so this is a hot topic, and I would be very clear. The Affordable Care Act included many very critical provisions on the cost side. They just don't get a lot of attention. Right. And I would say chief among them, the legal authority for the executive branch to test new payment models. And if the independent actuary of CMS certifies that those payment models improved quality, lowered cost, then the secretary of HHS has the authority to make that payment model available for the whole country without, wait for it, going back to Congress for a vote. The Affordable Care Act created a separate mechanism to in thoughtfully and rationally move the system to reward outcomes, which is the core policy intervention on uh, reducing costs. Well, there's two. Mathematically, price times volume equals revenue or expenditure, depending on how you look at it. We have a price problem in healthcare, and that price problem is getting worse and worse, and there's a political debate about the role of uh, the FTC and uh, antitrust and consolidation policy. The Affordable Care Act didn't quite do much, if anything, on that score, per se. But it did on the uh, volume or utilization side by saying, we're going to reorganize the payment structure, which has the natural effect of changing what, is get, what gets utilized. Punchline is, there's a bipartisan commitment to move payment to reward outcomes. One may argue that the Democratic view was to build on the fee-for-service uh, Medicare program, what you might think of it as the Medicare ACO program. Maybe, maybe conservatives might say, well, we really like Medicare Advantage. We think uh, you know, private insurance companies are better to organize this stuff. So we're, we're, you know, there may be a different implementation preference, but we're all trying to get down the road of if we can align the incentives between the physicians, the, the, the patients, the hospitals, we can actually get uh, less utilization, but actually better uh, outcomes. Clearly, what we need in in the big picture is to move healthcare <coughs> in the direction of value. Yes, as everybody's talking. Okay. Yes, and so the question is, what are the forces driving change in that direction? And cl arguably, the number one is a change in how it's healthcare is paid for. But uh, 
tell me what you think of the other forces are or how that force is playing out in terms of what are the forces that are driving change? Well, let's start with the stakeholders and kind of go down the list. Okay. So the, the tip of the spear in, in payment reform is the primary care physician. They're probably the highest leverage point. So you, you might look at this conversation and say, hey, let me go to the person that doesn't make the most, but has influence over the rest and say, I'm going to pay you more if you better organize the rest. And so in theory, that should motivate not only uh, behavior change, but maybe the following thing. Today, I look at my list of patients who are coming in to see me and I'm preparing mentally for the 18, 20, 25 patients. Now we're saying, you've got 2,000 patients, more than 1,900 of them are not coming in today. Who are the 15, 18, 20 you might want to reach out to because your reaching out might result in them actually getting better care and potentially avoiding something catastrophic like a heart attack or what have you. That is the desired outcome, that we think about the lists of the patients in front of us and how to treat them slightly better. Although some primary care doctors say, I'm already treating them better. Don't tell me I'm not doing a good job. I'll, I'll do a slightly better job, but I'm pretty good. Oh, but the new thing is, help me think about the people who are not here. Oh, well, that is kind of new. I haven't really, had hadn't really, you know, come into my mind. Okay, that's new. So that's, that's the tip of the spear. Now the awkward question. Uh, do those physicians have enough of the patient base of their 2,000? Are enough of those patients in a program that is rewarding them for doing this behavior? Have they reached a tipping point? If two percent of your, if one out of a, if two out of a hundred uh, are in this model, you're not really feeling the incentive. You go to the hospitals. This is complicated because ultimately a debate is we have a lot of un unnecessary hospitalization. So here you have a huge fixed cost business. You want them to reorganize themselves to further the utilization of their very service. And oh, by the way, the thank you for doing this is you get half of what you would have had before. Right, right. It is really not a good deal for the hospitals. Right. Now, in a market where you've got two hospitals, you say, well, wait a minute. I can be more efficient than hospital B. So maybe all those doctors who have got risk I'll tell them, bring all of your admissions to my hospital because I'll be much more responsive. I'll share all the data with you. I'll involve you in care planning. I'll make sure that length of stay is manageable. And I'll make sure that we've got good transition programs. So maybe the incentive is that hospitals will compete on being, I call it, ACO friendly. That hasn't happened yet, frankly, but let's assume it does in theory. Then that might pit hospital A over B in a competitive market where overall demand may fall, but I may see re uh, my market share grow. That, that's a second stakeholder. Pharma, fat and happy. They didn't get a lot of pressure in this thing. That's a bummer. We need to get pharma under control. So maybe we can start to introduce new mechanisms to bring value into the reimbursement process for pharma. We've got this convoluted pharma thing where, I don't know, that, that, it's a political negotiation, Lee. We missed that boat on that one. Hopefully, we can kind of start to get the system to move there, but there's not a lot of leverage in the system to get them uh, to a better place yet. The one that I care the most about, Lee, is the patient and their loved ones. And here's my bottom line. We know we have great care in pockets across the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If a patient was alerted, given their condition, the right doctor to see for the right service, if, if, if Siri could whisper in my ear, hey, you've got this condition. That primary care doctor, they can handle this and they've got a social worker combined that can help you this way, that way. If we routed people more intelligently, maybe we could get the patient to ultimately get better care even before the rest of the ecosystem comes along for the ride because they'll just route around the bad, the bad uh, performers. So I, I, I don't know. There are plenty of other stakeholders. The insurance companies, we get all of them. But at the end of the day, the biggest bet is on the primary care doctor thinking about the patients that are not in their office that day, and that's the mental map for where we so go. So I'm, I'm hearing two major driving forces. One is changing the currencies. Uh, the, in the current system, the currencies are the office visit and the procedure. <laughs> that's how I get paid, right? 
And, and you're going to tell me I don't get paid by the office visit. I get paid by my panel of 2,000? That, that's a big shift. It is. And, but, but slow to come. But I got two forces so far. Now, uh, what about, uh, what are the other driving forces? Is technology really a driving force? So it is an enabling force. Okay. You said driving. Right. And I want to be mindful, I was CTO, so you might presume I'd come into this room to say, tech is the answer, chest thump, woohoo! <laughs> I want you all to understand, I was never on that team. My bias is that it's in service too. Okay, so now. Enabler, said, not driver. Technology is the enabler. Well, that suggests that technologists need to be paying attention to these drivers and these changes. Yes. So let's talk a little bit more about the directions you see going yes. on yes. and how then the innovation community could could help it all happen. Uh, so, you know, if I'm the primary care doc, I mean, maybe you can teach uh, Alexa to be my partner in caring for grandma. Yeah, for the entrepreneurs in the room, hug an at-risk PCP with all your love because they're going to share with you all the questions they'd love to have answered in order to be successful in this model. Or they'll be inquisitive to know how others are answering questions and to interpret them in their own way. And then they're going to say, who can help me find these answers? Give me a list of patients whose last visit uh, had elevated blood pressure, but they have a history of uh, hypertension in their diagnosis field. Trend number one, the path to establishing a longitudinal health record runs through our patients. That's a theory that I'd love for all of us to hypothesize or test. But that is what I've concluded after a decade or so in public service, witnessing every other method, which is trying to get hospital A, hospital B, doctor C, all to open up their records with each other when they're competing and trying to like, you know, they even have a, there's a term of art for this, Lee, it's called leakage. This, this is my patient and now they've gone to your service. Yep. That's yep. leakage. Right. Yep. I don't want leakage. I want keepage. <laughs> so, 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 okay, that model means that we've got this inherent headwind on moving data for purposes of assembling the record to help that primary care doctor pick the list of patients they didn't do it. However, who has the legal right to pull their records out of any given hospital or doctor's office? HIPAA gives that right to me. And then the engineer said, aha, if it's a legal right, what does the legal right say? The legal right says the consumer has the right to a copy of their health records in a readily producible format. Well, when you don't have an interoperable EHR, pushing print is readily producible. But that's not fun. So we've got to come up a way, we had to come up with an engineering way that would allow a patient with a mobile app to be able to pull in their data and to make that readily producible. And I must say this, Epic, Cerner, Athena, McKesson, ECW, all the vendors, many, said let's do this together. Let's not, we're not gonna compete on how easy it is for the app to get the data. Let's get to an industry standard and let's make that happen. So that, now what's funny is, the technologists have reached consensus and they're starting to ship the technology to do this. So driver one, this is now coming into the muscle mass of the economy. Driver two, it will be inhibited because doctors and hospitals don't know to turn it on, or some might not want to. So now the new barrier is the institution. The uh, problem legally is that data held by the patient is not subject to any HIPAA requirements. So for those, those of us that followed the Equifax situation, like cybersecurity is a problem, Lee. That's a major headwind, okay? Yeah. And I'm not here to tell you that that's like easily solvable. That is a problem. But the legal construct is, if I've got my medical records on my mobile phone, there are no protections. We might want to come up with a voluntary framework that says, I agree to not sell your data without knowing. I agree to do no harm. Basically, a digital Hippocratic Oath. If we together develop the digital Hippocratic Oath, then that may create a protection for consumers that is not readily available on the internet. And I think once we get through that process, we'll have the foundation. You marry the incentive with opening up the medical records, 
And the third trend, data held by government, like the Medicare system itself, is now also being made available so you get better situational awareness. You combine incentives with open government data, with regulated APIs, and you've got the opportunity for an entrepreneur and innovator to come together and help hug that PCP and say, I will make your lives better. Let's do this together. Let's go fix patient care. And that's why I'm so bullish, because that's, that story is coming together, even if it doesn't look like it on the headline. At the same time, uh, this whole digital health arena is subject to uh, the influence of, of the software revolution, right? And we've, we've been trained to believe that software is quick, easy, and profitable. And yet, arguably, anything in health is slow, painful, and problematic with respect to profit. I would argue it's not a unique digital health phenomenon. I would say the minute you bring tech-enabled solutions to any of the regulated sectors, writ large, All right. you've got to find a thoughtful way to integrate those technologies into a broader offering that meet whatever regime and business incentive and world that operates. And that is super exciting for the globe because what are the sectors of the economy that have the least productivity growth? It's the regulated sectors of the economy. There are headwinds that are non-technical, that are getting in the way of an obvious way to bring value, harnessing the power and potential of the internet. The amount of talent. With all due respect, if you're the best AI mind, the job you've been hired to do is tag photos. And that is lovely. And I welcome anyone. It's a delight for me to be able to find the photos with my wife in it and have that be its own filter. It's a delightful experience. So thank you for the AI ML teams to make that happen for me. But for many on those teams, it's not as rewarding. So they're finding this opportunity to dip their toe into healthcare. And th there's like this giant recruitment push to bring that talent into health. And they're not looking for a quick win. They're looking for meaning. And that is extremely exciting. What's the Coase theorem? Put your resources to their highest and best use. Societally, maybe these resources put to their highest and best use might find the magnet of healthcare. Look, we talked about this, Lee. If we get to GDP plus zero for healthcare inflation over the next decade to two, we close our budget deficits. We can fund climate change mitigation strategies without yeah. raising taxes. Yeah. Right. We can pay for tax cuts. We can do all kinds of great things. So, a the few. talent magnet doesn't need the same payout structure because I think people are mission driven. So it's a complicated swamp, and there are alligators in the swamp, but there's really important work to be done, and you're optimistic that the, uh, the technologists among us can, if, if, if they pay attention to the realities of what's going on in healthcare and, and do their best work, can really make a difference. And because of these new the, 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 the welcome mat is open. If you are a physician and you think, I would love to perform this work because performing this work will result in better care, but no one pays me for this work. There's a front door at the Department of Health and Human Services called PTAC, where any physician anywhere in the United States of America can write a letter and say, please test my crazy idea. And if they evaluate and approve that test, you get potentially some funding and maybe some research experiment time. And you can run that experiment and show the world what you can do. Give us whatever pearls you might have for innovators as, as they think about this remarkable complexity of the intersection of science, technology, and this beast we call healthcare. Yeah. Any, any suggestions for them about how they, how they navigate this? opportunity slash obstacle? Study the question before you invent the solution. Ah, yeah. Is that awkward? No, no that, that, that's, it's pretty fundamental and it's surprising how often we fail to do it. I will say uh, the number of people that would say, Anish, 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 let me tell you what I've done with this widget. What problem are you trying to solve? And how is this widget solving it in a way that the previous way didn't? But my widget is awesome. It's blockchain enabled, AI, ML, and it presumes. Oh my lord, give me a break. No offense, that's wonderful, and I love the spirit and enthusiasm. But 
Eye on the prize, people. Eye on the prize. Yep. What's the problem I'm trying to solve? And how might this be better demonstrably than the alternative? And frankly, just the, the back end of healthcare. There's an enormous potential to streamline workflows, to teach providers how to take risk. I mean, there's so layer after layer here. It, right? it is. And uh, for the entrepreneurs in the room, listen to this. So my successor, whom I love like a brother, uh, Todd Park, uh, often used to say, uh, there are certain sectors of the economy where there's low-hanging fruit. This era in healthcare, the fruit is plentiful on the ground. You don't even have to reach up. It's like there's so many inefficiencies. So the opportunities are endless. And each one of these opportunities, if you pick them up and you take advantage, result in societal benefit. My goodness, what other rewarding part of our lives that what we're doing and how we're compensated is for the betterment of the greater good and it takes advantage of the training. It's such an amazing time to be in healthcare if you can live at this intersection. And the hard part's gonna be to find those primary care doctors to hug as an example and to listen, listen and listen to the problems and anticipate so do you have pom poms? You're a cheerleader. I mean, I'm you, very bullish. Okay, I'm very bullish. Fantastic. I'm bullish and I'm hopeful and I am sad about all the Charlottesville and the Trumpism and the popcorn and the depressing. But that aside, the underlying tailwind headwind ratio, there's more tailwind than headwind. And the more we inform folks that weren't aware about XYZ things, if three of you in this room tonight learned something you didn't know and you could go out and make magic happen, then we can just come back and celebrate, like put you on a blog post, honor you, throw roses. It'd be just a great time.